It's a well-known feature of warfare that the majority of casualties come not from being slain on the battlefield, but rather from being dragged down by the wounds and infections in its aftermath. Thus, an army's medical proficiency can be just as important in achieving victory as its combat abilities. In this capacity, Roman excellence on both fronts is what made the legions such formidable war machines. Yet, unfortunately, it is Rome's soldiers rather than its doctors who get all the glory in modern media. So today, let us right this wrong by shedding a light on these unsung heroes by exploring their organization, hospitals, training, care, and recovery. This is the history of Rome's military medical service. So I've been making documentaries on YouTube for about a decade now, and I have to say it's been some of the most enriching and rewarding work I've ever done. But to peel back the curtain here, this enjoyment comes from about 10% of the work, whereas the rest, the 90% of it is drudge work when it comes to collecting footage, editing, managing the whole process, and more, you name it. Luckily, today's sponsor, Storyblocks, is here to make this whole process much easier and empower you guys to make your own documentaries. They're a massive one-stop shop for HD footage, images, music, sound effects, templates, and more. Let's say you want to make a documentary. You've done your research, prepped a script, and recorded your audio. Now what? Well, just grab some B-roll of ancient locations, people, and props, then stitch it together with a few slick transitions and titles, slap on some ambient sound effects and music, and you're basically there. In the past, this might run you hundreds of dollars, but with Storyblocks, you get unlimited downloads from their entire library with a simple monthly or annual subscription with no hidden or extra fees. They've definitely got creators in mind with the Storyblocks plugin for Adobe Creative Cloud that puts the entire stock library at your fingertips while editing in Premiere Pro or After Effects. They've also ensured that all content is whitelisted on YouTube, so you won't have to deal with those pesky copyright battles. To get started with unlimited stock media downloads at one set price, head to storyblocks.com invicta or click the link in the description below. Enjoy! And finally, I also wanted to shout out the two reenactment groups that made this episode possible. Veteris Milites and Imperium Romanum. Imperium Romanum actually has their own YouTube channel, which I highly recommend you check out because they make their own fantastic documentaries and clearly have the passion and skill to pull it off to superb results. I'll link both in the description below. In order to orient ourselves, it will first be helpful to quickly review the history of Roman military medicine. This had begun in the nascent years of their society around the 8th century BC. Understandably, such practices were initially quite primitive, involving a mix of practical home treatments and religious remedies. The former arose from their agrarian lifestyle, whereby self-reliant families had gradually discovered ways to leverage the medical properties of their local plants and animals. The latter, meanwhile, arose from the highly superstitious nature of these same individuals. Maladies, for instance, were often attributed to sinful behavior and angry gods, with the appropriate cures involving a mix of prayer, offerings, incantations, spells, and other magic or religious practices. Over the years, the sophistication of medical care would gradually improve. This would largely be driven by foreign influence, with many physicians coming from nearby Greece, where a more robust field of study and practice had evolved thanks to yet further native and foreign influences. Increasingly, around the 3rd to 1st centuries BC, such Greek doctors made their way to Rome to serve as specialist slaves to start their own practices and even to establish schools. Military medicine of the Republican era, therefore, came to mirror that of their Eastern counterpart. This involved a rather ad hoc system whereby commanders and higher ups paid for their own private physicians, while the rank and file troops were largely left to care for one another as best they could. Since battles were close to home, wounded or sick troops would be brought back to Roman territory where it was a civic duty for citizens to help provide for their recovery. 
During the late Republic, however, as armies served for longer periods further afield, this system naturally evolved. By the time of Caesar's Gallic Wars, for instance, we see examples of physicians being made available to the whole army, with combat medics treating battlefield injuries and the wounded being evacuated in wagons to recover in camp or in billeted housing. Yet the level of care was far from uniform and very much seems to have come down to the preferences of a given commander. However, this would all change with the transition to empire and the advent of Rome's professional armies. Such a transformation was made possible by the massive military shakeups which followed the end of the civil wars. In their aftermath, Emperor Augustus reduced and standardized the number of mobilized forces down to just 25 permanent legions, which would be strategically distributed across the empire. A key part of these important reorganizations would be the creation of a dedicated medical corps that would be attached to each legion. Yet Augustus did not stop there. To ensure these new positions were filled, he helped establish a robust set of incentives. Chief among these was the granting of full citizenship and equestrian status to all physicians. Furthermore, any such medical staff who entered the service would receive all the same land grants and retirement benefits as their comrades in arms. There were also special rights carved out for military doctors to protect them against fraud and help them establish practices in the civilian world upon discharge. Thanks to these measures, a healthy supply of military doctors was maintained. Over the years, each generation would learn from the last, while having a chance to pioneer with their own methods. In this way was a deep institutional knowledge built up among the legions and disseminated through oral lessons, written texts, and live demonstrations. The end result was one of the most sophisticated medical institutions of its age. Having thus covered the evolution of Roman medicine, let us now delve into the actual organization of the Roman military's medical corps. At a higher level, there does not seem to have been any empire-wide medical administration with a single leader or even a governing body. Rather, the institution existed independently within all branches of the military, be it the infantry, cavalry, auxiliary or naval forces. Each version would have varied. For our purposes, we shall focus on the more standardized incarnation of the medical system within each legion. Here, the service's senior officer would have been the legionary commander. However, he did not have any medical training himself, being instead involved from a purely administrative standpoint. Yet even this scope appears to have been rather hands-off, as is evidenced by the fact that the provision of medical supplies was a responsibility delegated to his second-in-command, the Prefectus Castrorum, or Camp Prefect. However, he too lacked any medical qualifications. To find such men, we shall have to continue down the organization. The highest ranking physician would have been the Medicus Legionis, who acted as the Legion's chief medical officer. Such men were often experienced professionals recruited from the civilian world to serve for a specified period of time in the army. Beneath them were about a dozen doctors who, in accordance with general army practice, may have bore the title of Medicus Cohortis. These physicians would have been distinguished by their various specialties and grades. The most esteemed among them were the Chirurgii, or surgeons. As their title implies, these were men qualified enough to handle the scalpel. They were rare, with only a handful of surgeons being found in a typical legion. To illustrate this point, here is how the ancient author Celsus describes their qualifications. Quote, now, a surgeon should be youthful, or at any rate, nearer youth than age, with a strong and steady hand which never trembles, and ready to use the left hand as well as the right, with vision sharp and clear, and spirit undaunted, 
filled with pity so that he wishes to cure his patient, yet is not moved by his cries to go too fast or cut less than is necessary. But he does everything just as if the cries of pain cause him no emotion. Among the medicus cohortes came other high-ranking specialists, such as the ocularius, or eye doctor, the auricularius, or ear doctor, and the urologists. Beneath them came the mid-ranking physicians who bore the title of medicus ordinarius. Such men had entered the service as regular soldiers, receiving medical training over the years and eventually rising to the rank of centurion. By this point in their careers, they would have accumulated an incredible amount of experience in one of the best training programs of its era. The skills of such veteran army doctors were apparently so valuable that we have records of men in their 80s still actively treating the soldiers of their legion. Beneath the specialists were lower-ranking doctors and assistants. These might be assigned specific roles, such as the Optio Convalescentium, who was in charge of recovering troops, the Seplesiarius, who was responsible for the supply of medical ointments, and the Marsus, who treated snake and scorpion stings. These men may have held the grade of Medicus Duplicarius or Medicus Sesquiplicarius, meaning medic at double or one and a half times pay respectively. The rest of the staff, meanwhile, would be on call to assist their superiors with any tasks that might be needed. In this way, could such army orderlies slowly develop their own skills. And finally, the bottom rank of the medical hierarchy were the combat medics, known as the Capsarii. Such men bore the same combat gear as their fellow soldiers and could fight if needed. However, their role was to locate injured men on the front line and apply first aid. This often meant bandaging wounds or otherwise providing enough rudimentary care to stabilize a situation. In and of itself, such immediacy of care saved many lives when compared to the situation in other armies. Another critical facet of Roman battlefield medicine was triage, whereby trained staff would help assess casualties and sort them according to the type and urgency of care required. Based on these criteria, soldiers would then be moved to the rear by hand, by stretcher or by cart. Here, they would be placed into the care of the doctors and orderlies we previously mentioned. With the staff of the medical system thus described, we can now turn our attention to its physical infrastructure. Logistically speaking, when men were injured on the front lines of combat or their other duties, they would be evacuated to the nearest treatment facilities. Often this would take the form of a field hospital, which would either be a tented space near the army's rear guard or in its marching camp. Here, a few dozen medical apprentices would provide basic care to the injured. This included getting them seated or bedded, assessing injuries, cleaning wounds, and providing food, water, or wine as needed. Apprentices would then be on standby to assist and observe the work of doctors. Yet, while such facilities were kept as clean and organized as possible, it was not a place for specialized care or long-term recovery. For such treatment, soldiers would have been transferred to the Legion's permanent base. Here would be found the main army hospital, or Valetudinarium. Located within the heart of a legionary fortress, these were well-protected, well-supplied, and well-staffed facilities. The buildings themselves were marvels of patient-oriented design. In terms of their layout, this took the form of a hollow rectangle, measuring about 75 by 100 meters. The front featured a large doorway, which gave way to a wide hall. This allowed for the efficient intake and clearing of wounded soldiers. Flanking it were administrative, records, storage, and staff rooms. 
The other three sides of the layout consisted of long corridors with wards to either side. These paired rooms, each measuring about 2.5 by 4 meters, would house patients and were estimated to have a total capacity for anywhere between 5 and 10 percent of a legion's manpower. But within this general layout would be included additional facilities. For instance, a certain number of wards were built for isolation of patients, while others were used for inspection. Archaeological finds indicate that the eastern wing of some sites featured storage rooms, pantries and kitchens for the preparation of special diets and meals. The west wing, meanwhile, featured lavatories, changing rooms and a series of baths. And finally, the north wing might house the hospital's mortuary. At the centre of it all was the courtyard. Here, one would find the operating theatre for the performance of surgeries. Attached to it was a type of oven used to sterilise tools and nearby was located a medical herb garden. Altogether, such facilities provided some of the most comprehensive care of the era. But there are additional details of construction we must also highlight for a full appreciation of their brilliance. The first key feature would be lighting. Roman hospitals were filled with clerestory windows to ensure critical activities were properly illuminated. At night, an elaborate system of lamps and candles further maintained this visibility. The second key feature would be heating and cooling. The high windows and pitched roofs helped evacuate hot air, creating a natural airflow which helped induce a ventilating breeze. On cold days, windows would be closed and a central facility activated its heated tile system, which can also be seen in many Roman bath complexes. The third key feature would be its water system. Here, pipes and channels helped bring in fresh water for use in the kitchens, baths and lavatories. This could also be used to routinely clean the facilities. Wastewater would then be drained and discharged away from camp. Truly, the organisation and infrastructure of a legion's medical system was a marvel of its time. Yet so far, we have only been able to explore it from a high level. In our next episode, we shall descend to the ground level to take a closer look at the training, tools and techniques of Rome's army doctors. For now, you can catch script previews, download all our art and participate in polls by supporting us on Patreon or YouTube memberships. A big thanks to the current supporters for funding the channel and to the researchers, writers and artists for making this episode possible. We couldn't have done it without this team and this community. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe for more content and check out these other related videos. See you in the next one.